an in, a potent inhibition of the reuptake of dopamine, which by the way, if you want to think of another compound that does that, cocaine does that, amphetamines do that. So, eh, it's, I don't know about that. Hello friends, welcome to another segment from my series on the cholinergic system. We're finally approaching the end of my review. And today is the second part of my uh, lecture on um, analogs, or not analogs, but agonists of the um, nicotinic cholinergic receptors. You'll recall that we have two kinds of receptors or two sorts of receptors characterized by what agonizes them other than acetylcholine. One are called the muscarinic receptors and one are called the nicotinic receptors. Last time we covered uh, about half of the agonists that I wanted to cover other than nicotine. And today we're gonna cover three more, all inspired by um, uh, nature. The first one is derived from a worm and ants, a worm called the uh, ribbon worm. Uh, they have this uh, toxin called anabasine. Anabasine paralyzes insects and crustaceans, but uh, does not do so to vertebrates, thankfully. And what it does do to vertebrates, though, is it causes a release of dopamine and norepinephrine. And it obviously uh, bonds to the uh, nicotinic cholinergic receptors. The University of Florida at Gainesville, in partnership with a Japanese pharmaceutical firm, who I don't recall their name, but it begins with a T, I think maybe Taiho Pharmaceutical, created an analog called GTS-21. GTS-21 uh, has, has shown a greater affinity for the alpha-7 receptor as opposed to the alpha-4 beta-2 receptor that nicotine has a great affinity for. And it's being researched for uh, basically for attention in uh, Alzheimer's disease and ADHD. Now, I'm not really sure why this analog is being researched for attention because um, it seems that nicotine has an incredible effect on uh, attention and focus and it mainly targets the alpha 4 beta 2. Maybe it's just experimental and they want to see if targeting the alpha 7 would be helpful. Now the thing about the alpha 7, well let's talk about it with the next um, with the next uh, agonist. So the next agonist comes from a snake that's found in China. It's called the many-banded uh, crate snake. Uh, this snake has a venom that particularly targets the alpha-7 receptor. So as you'll recall from the GTS-21 discussion, that one was preferentially targeting the alpha-7 receptor, and this one is two. This analog created out of the toxin was called uh, SEN12333, which is SEN12333, and it targets preferentially the alpha-7 receptor, and is being researched not only for Alzheimer's disease, uh, but also for schizophrenia. Uh, I think that this is probably the case because the um, alpha-7 receptor, the genetic equivalent of the alpha-7 receptor, which is this um, the CHRNA7 gene, has been tied to schizophrenia. So it may, maybe agonizing that receptor uh, is thought, I mean, maybe it's thought that agonizing that receptor could yield some antipsychotic benefit. Um, but in general, these all should be somewhat neuroprotective. Um, the final, uh, anal uh, the final uh, agonist that we'll talk about comes from a plant, a genus of plants called the Indian tobacco plant in the U.S. Uh, the, the chemical is called Lobline. Now, I'm not sure if, it's, if I'm pronouncing it right. It sounds quite similar to a YouTuber's name. I'm, I'm not sure if, if that is a YouTuber's name. I think it is. But anyway, it's quite interesting. It's a pyridine alkaloid that's found in the Indian tobacco plant. And um, it, so when, when isolated, this chemical exerts a agonizing effect that is six times less potent than nicotine on the alpha three beta two receptor. However, which is not the main receptor that nicotine exerts its influence on anyway. So this means it's quite uh, less potent. However, it has a trait that is similar to what we saw with galantamine as well as another chemical earlier, which is that it exerts positive allosteric modulation of the alpha-4 uh, beta-2 receptor, which is the main receptor that nicotine directly agonizes. What does that mean? That means that it sensitizes that receptor class to uh, agonists like acetylcholine or nicotine. In particular, it's been studied in combination with nicotine. Now, the thing about this uh, chemical, Loblin, is quite interesting. So, in animal studies, 
they say that it does not cause habituation or addiction. But this is confusing because this chemical has been shown in animal studies to cause a release of dopamine, a release of norepinephrine, and an in a potent inhibition of the reuptake of dopamine, which by the way, if you want to think of another compound that does that, cocaine does that, amphetamines do that. So, eh, it's, I don't know about that, about it not causing habituation. It's also been reported to cause a release of serotonin, but I'm not sure how, um, how robustly that has been shown. So I didn't mention it in my literature review. Um, anyway, it's being studied uh, in relation to, uh, uh, well, the thing is in, in rodent studies, it's been shown, okay, this is now another, another level of confusion. In rodent studies, it's been shown to, well, this part is normal. It's been shown to exert an antidepressive effect, which makes sense if you're, uh, you know, if you give a rodent cocaine, you'll look less depressed for the day as well. But uh, it's been shown to cause rodents to not be, uh, to, not ex to not voluntarily drink alcohol as, uh, ethanol as much. So this is, this is curious. I wonder how that happens. If it's, if it's causing a release of dopamine and inhibiting the reuptake of dopamine and causing a release of serotonin and ethanol, I wonder why it would cause them to drink less. It's, it's, a, it's not a, a straightforward uh, consideration. But because of this, researchers have been interested in potential effects uh, or potential uses in addiction treatment. Um, so it's been studied, uh, being studied right now for ADHD. In general, I don't think, as you guys will have noticed from watching the rest of the series, I'm very concerned, well not concerned, I'm very um, hesitant about any uh, chemical uh, agonists that also cause an interference with dopamine and serotonin. I think such things should be used very sparingly and when one wants to uh, agonize uh, dopamine receptors or cause a release of dopamine or one wants to cause a release of serotonin or agonize serotonin, it's probably better to use uh, chemicals that are better understood and have a longer history of being uh, tested with uh, human trials. Um, and also to be just generally hesitant uh, in, in, in you know, agonizing those receptors in general because they, they tend to downregulate very quickly, which is of course why um, antidepressants are not um, agonists, direct agonists of the uh, dopamine receptors or the serotonin receptors. Um, and that's why, you know, the, the main classes of them are reuptake inhibitors as opposed to agonists. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this, the end of the nicotinic uh, cholinergic agonist review. In the next uh, segment, I'm going to, I'm going to introduce you to the genome-wide association studies on uh, the nicotinic cholinergic genes. And then I will do a final video sort of summarizing uh, what can be learned from the series of discussion that we've had so far. Thank you so much for listening and be sure to check out the blog post below if you want more information. Have a great day.